today I have, uh, I have good news and bad news. Um, the good news is um, that we have Paula Duperna here, who's a producer, writer. Um, she worked with Cousteau. She, um, she's a thinker. She, she was an advisor. Um, she's been an, a, advising on, uh, particularly on green finance in recent, in recent years. Um, and she's currently visiting a visiting fellow with Civic Exchange, the, uh, the, Hong Kong, the leading Hong Kong uh, think tank. And she's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations in the US. Um, so that's the good news is we have, um, towards the end of her Hong Kong visit, you've been here for, what, a couple of months, I think now, um, she's going to speak to us today. The bad news is that our speaker can't actually speak because she has lost her voice. Um, so I'm going to, um, she literally has completely lost her voice, so she can only whisper. Um, so what we're going to do is um, get, we're going to ask Joyce Lau of Civic Exchange to kindly read out her, her talk, um, which has a few slides, the pictures that you'll be able to see. And then uh, we'll open it up to questions. But I think the best way to proceed is if, if you could write down a few questions, and we can pass around a notebook or something, uh, during, the, during the talk um, that Joyce will be reading out, uh, then I can pass them on uh, to Paula, and she can, uh, she can write down some replies, and I can pass them on to you. I think that even with the amplification, it's going to be very, very hard to hear her. Um, so that's probably the best way we'll have to proceed. So, you know, think of a few interesting questions you want to ask in the course of your lunch and while, um, while Joyce is speaking, and we'll take it from there. And uh, apologies for that, but, uh, but she's had a lot of engagements recently, and uh, as you can see, she's, she's much in demand. Um, so, big welcome to, to Paula, and I'll ask Joyce to come up and, and do, the, uh, do the voiceover, as it were. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Paula would like to thank everyone for coming and for the FCC for arranging. She apologizes that her voice is given out after nearly eight weeks in Hong Kong where she has done many, many different talks, um, including with Civic Exchange. So I'm just going to read a quote from her. She says, I am never humble enough in the face of my good fortune to be able to make and have made a living as a writer for the most part. The gift of words is a gift indeed. The truth all the more important today than perhaps any time in my life or career. So Paula was going to speak about her writer's journey from coral reefs to carbon markets. Um, she starts by saying that she always wanted to be a writer from a very early fascination with books and the stories that her mother would tell her when she was little. She felt that her mother also wanted to be a writer, but didn't know how to make that dream into practice. And then one day, Paula did make that her dream. It started when Paula finished graduate school and was teaching at an alternative high school in New York City. The New York City was facing bankruptcy, and it decided to solve its budget crisis by axing the school budget, including letting go teachers with the least seniority, including Paula and her peers. Paula found that so short-sighted, so detrimental to the city's welfare, and she was burning to tell the story. So Paula told it to a journalist, a professor, Victor Navasky, who is legendary now in the US. And then he told her to call another editor at the Village Voice, which is an alternative newspaper in New York, to use his name. That editor, Ross Weston, was another legendary editor gave Paula her first assignment, which of course was on spec. And he let her do a rewrite when he rejected her first attempt. And I'm sure all the writers here have been through this. Quote, too boring, a perfect example of an interesting story that turns out too boring on the page. <laughs> but Paula did rewrite it and it was published and she was paid $150 for which she bought a piece of Nigerian sculpture that she still has today. So that was her beginning. Um, Paula kept writing on school issues. And then one day, she was given the gift of a membership to the Cousteau Society. And she saw that the organization was looking for volunteer writers and editors to work on a book, the Cousteau Almanac. Paula volunteered, thinking this is a good way to learn about ocean science even though at the time she wasn't interested in the environment per se. The next day she got a call from the editor, Mose Richard, and was offered a full-time salary job on the book. That changed her life. She worked on the book, 
she began writing films. She got very close to the principal, Jacques Cousteau. So here's, here's a picture of Paula. Um, Jacques-Yves Cousteau's films were on TV all around the world. The same one was viewed by 200 million people the same night. So he was very famous. At first, Paula handled logistics. She was keeping the crews moving, not missing any good stories. I think there's a picture of her in the, in the van or the Jeep. Um, she wrote narrations. She became a co-producer. And Cousteau was the first one to link her to environmental economics. He knew it intuitively then. Many economists, including Herman Daly, were already talking about those issues that we have discovered today, like natural capital. Paula vividly remembers one day. Cousteau took out a dollar bill and said that when he was a boy, a dollar represented a dollar's worth of sweat and labor. But today, the dollar represented a dollar's worth of oil. He was already focused on energy and its waste and impact. And his comments focused Paula on the hidden value of natural resources and how financial resources are needed to find some way to express that hidden value. Paula worked very closely with Cousteau on key policy matters, particularly concerning the United Nations and Antarctica. So this is a picture of them working closely together. Cousteau was so famous that he could secure a meeting with anyone who wanted to meet him. They worked with heads of state and just about anyone else. Uh, they had fantastic access to the top, and Paula began to see how big decisions are made uh, quickly very often. To avoid inertia, implementation is key, and that was Paula's key role for Cousteau and his policy side. To implement the big ideas he was launching to this or that high-level person. One thing to say about Cousteau is that he was an excellent writer in French and English, and he never, as we say, published his byline on someone else. If he wrote it, he put his name on it. If Paula wrote it, she put her name on it. The next photo is of Paula in a Gumby suit, there she is, in Alaska after a major oil spill, Exxon Valdez. Uh, they were flying over the site, it was the middle of winter. They had to wear these survival suits in case the helicopter crashed or had to make an emergency landing. The suits would keep them afloat and alive for only 15 minutes until they could be rescued. They were in the sound, not the ocean, but as you can see, it was so big, it would have filled with water immediately. Anyways, obviously, Paula survived that. What struck Paula most is what Cousteau said. Many seabirds and otters were soaked with oils and the beaches were soiled. But, ooh, sorry, hit that by accident. But Cousteau said, yes, a spill is a terrible thing, but the real crime is to take the oil out of the ground at today's prices. Paula began to think about that, the relationship of price to scarcity, scarcity and the value of waste. Paula was also charged with not wasting time in expeditions. So this is, um, oh, this is the flying fox. And, and every moment, because film time was expensive. So this is Paula, I see her, on a flying fox in New Zealand, getting across a river with the film crew so they could save one costly day on the road. Uh, Paula stayed with Jacques Cousteau for nearly 20 years and did many big things. One of the most important was the expedition to Cuba where we made a film, but also secure, where Paula made a film, but they also secured the release of 50 political prisoners from Cuban jails. Paula never told the story in detail until last year when she wrote about it for a UK publication called Avant, which you can read. Suffice it to say, there were no three people less destined to meet than Paula, Jacques Cousteau, and Fidel Castro. And yet they did meet and they got along well to develop a trust that enabled Castro to release those prisoners as a token of his respect for Cousteau. It also allowed Paula to work with the US government and they had no official diplomatic relations to get entry visas for the prisoners who were all men. This was a different kind of wheeling and dealing, but words did play into it because they wrote a letter to each of the prisoners. And in this photo, you can see the notebook. I don't know if you can, is that the notebook on your, against your dress? As we wrote the draft, we flew back to the US in our small seaplane. 
In the meanwhile, Paula continued writing books. Um, there are some people who say the book is an op increasingly obsolete form, but Paula loves writing books and intends to write more. Here are some of the covers, including the one with an orange, and to get the nearly free Amazon stamp on it. And there's another about the first golf course designed in America, an environmental health story about a mother who began to suspect that water pollution was the culprit in the cases of leukemia developing in her young son and the children of her neighbors. And there's also a fictional account of what the so-called new world would have been like if the wife of Christopher Columbus was on his first voyage. So those are her three books. In between all of this, Paula also ran for US Congress as a Democratic candidate. Here she is campaigning. By then, she was a committed environmentalist. She took a leave of absence from her Cousteau job and with his blessing, blessing ran in a five-way race of no political experience. She got a third of the vote, spending only 30,000 US dollars. Uh, she mentioned this in her speech because of today's emphasis in the United States on women running for office, especially in response to sexual harassment trends. But at the time, uh, Paula did it for leadership reasons. She was able to run on a very small budget because she wrote almost all her own speeches and materials, being a writer. Paula still believes that all people should run for some kind of office. There is nothing like the experience of listening to the concerns of people to understand what and how to make systems change. Then there was another fork in the road. Through her work of Cousteau at the United Nations, she met another genius, Richard Sandor who is as famous as Cousteau in the world of economics and known as the father of financial futures. He had worked with the US EPA on the historic cap and trade, which is a US invention, to help eliminate sulfur dioxide. This is the chief antagonist in classic air pollution. Um, he was becoming interested in environmental issues and was designing environmental markets. Uh, he was one of the first, if not the first person in the world to formalize them. Uh, Richard Sander became convinced that the cap and trade principle could work for climate change as well, even though there were six gases, not one, and he had been invited by the United Nations to share his views at the landmark Rio summit in 1992. This is a long time ago. Paula met Richard in 1995. By 1999, she had left work of Cousteau and had been recruited to become the head of a US, uh, major US philanthropy. She reconnected with Richard and together they planned the design and pilot phase of what became the Chicago Climate Exchange. This is the first integrated cap and trade in the world that handled all six greenhouse gases and still the only six gas system in history. She worked with Richard directly as the president of the International Division, and together they began an adventure to bring carbon markets to China. They did this in a joint venture with PetroChina and the city of Tianjin. And, and she says, she calls it our child, um, being the Tianjin Climate Exchange. Uh, this is the first of China's seven pilot markets, opened in September 2008. And you can see here the cannon shot and the gold confetti for the opening ceremony. The Tianjin Climate Exchange legitimized the cap and trade idea publicly. It triggered, triggered other pilots. Now the world awaits the full-scale launch of China's national cap and trade, which was founded on the experience of pilots, which brought China time to train its next generation of environmental market practitioners. This is an undertaking of world importance. Paula believes that a carbon market is so far the world's best and most practical tool for translating the intangible value of space in the atmosphere to the tangible expression of money through an allowance that has tradable financial value, a complex but promising system to basically ration the right to send greenhouse grasses into the atmosphere, where we are running out of room and to make it so expensive to pollute and to buy the allowances that not polluting will be far cheaper. So now Paula is pulling together all the threads of her life 
and giving talks, and, and she jokes that maybe too many talks, given the state of her voice, and writing and affixing herself to strategic organizations such as the CDP and Civic Exchange. As for the coral reefs in the title of this talk, she never actually learned to dive with Cousteau, but she wanted to maintain the distance from the topic that the audience might have. She has a lot of beautiful footage of reefs and has written about them. She knows that they replicate and burst into exuberance in relationship to the full moon. So they also, in a way, look into outer space, the home of our beautiful planet. Yeah. To Paula, this is what it's about today. And you can see in this photo that, that thin halo, that little uh, bright blue um, thread. This thin halo on the earth protects us from the burning heat of the sun. This is what Paula calls the cosmic penthouse. To protect it is the purpose of carbon markets. And so from reefs below the sea to the sight of the stars, Paula has been lucky to ride the magic carpet of writing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joyce. That, that, that was wonderful. Actually, let's leave that photo up because I, I really like it. I remember going to a, um, uh, an astronomical observatory in the middle of the desert in South Africa, incredibly high and dry place. And uh, the thing that most impressed me, apart from, of course, the astonishing views of the planets and the stars, and I think it was then Halley's Comet that was going through the sky, was the astronomer who said, who pointed out what a tiny sort of thing we were in the middle of space. And he pointed out this very thing, which is that the you know, we, we, we all survive because of this tiny little um, thin layer of air that's around, well, atmosphere that surrounds the Earth. And, and it really sort of struck me then how extraordinarily vulnerable the whole, the whole place is. And, and one just forgets that all too easily, that there's only about 40,000 feet of oxygen, um, uh, you know, between here and, uh, and up there. So um, thanks very much for, for your talk. And thank you to Joyce for, for giving it. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, I was very glad to hear a couple of other things in there, actually. I was, I was glad to hear that books are not obsolete, obviously. And, and I now really want to read the book about the wife of, uh, you know, what Christopher Columbus would have done if he'd had his wife with, wife with him, because I sort of imagine um, that he perhaps, perhaps would have realized that he wasn't in India. You know, he, he thought he was going to find the Ganges River in what is now Honduras. Uh, and as a result of that, of course, um, uh, Native Americans or indigenous Americans became known as Indians, which, of course, they weren't. Um, and, and it was also good to hear about otters. Um, I kind of, uh, I had a, a good year last year. I've seen otters in two new countries where I've never seen them before, which is pretty exciting. Um, uh, one, was, um, one was the United States in Massachusetts, a, a pond where I've been going for years. And for the first time in 20 years, I saw otters there, which was exciting. And I saw some in Ireland as well and seen them previously in, from places like India and, and, and indeed in Scotland. And one often forgets that otters are out there because... They, they're sort of fairly shy, but, uh, you know, and you have to go to interesting places to see them. Um, uh, also, also really good about, about Jacques Cousteau, actually. I, I, uh, as a child, I used to watch, I think we had black and white TV in those days, but we used to watch this weird French guy saying, and now we saw the little fishes, you know. And we always remember that as sort of children watching TV with this strange Frenchman talking about the world, which we knew nothing about. This was long before the days of... Um, of um, uh, what's it called, Big Blue, Blue Blue Planet from David Attenborough, you know. So filming techniques were incredibly primitive by comparison with today, but it was still really, really exciting. And I think he invented scuba diving, didn't he? He was the co-invented, yeah. Um, he was, you know, that was where scuba diving um, came from, uh, from his expeditions. Now, so normally I would ask you to keep your questions incredibly short so that our speaker can expatiate a great length on what you have to ask. On this occasion, I would urge you to keep them long <laughs> to, save her, to save her voice. Uh, and actually, you know, if you want to ask a question, also tell us you know, what you think about the subjects that have been raised, particularly environmental issues, particularly climate finance and so on. I'd be happy to hear what you have to say. But also, of course, um, we, will, you know, we will try and uh, write down some answers to, to whatever questions you have. Um, so um, who uh, has sent in a question that might have been answered? Um, Perhaps you could. Um, uh, have we got some more? Um, okay. Um, oh well, maybe we'll. Shall we start with you? Um, if you pass a mic over here, a microphone over here to this gentleman, um, since we know. Um, okay. No, it's okay. 
Yeah, no, no. Um, and oh, yes, of course, you need to see it, don't you? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was the answer. That's another question. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So I'll start with something else. Sorry. Um, yes, I, I thought that was your answer already. Um, so one second, and we'll we'll move on. Um, I. Um, I asked a question about Jacques Cousteau, of course, because, as, as I mentioned, I used to watch him as a child, and I said, and I asked her what it was like being with Jacques Cousteau, uh, and Paula said, uh, simply, it was one of the best jobs in the world that I ever could have had. So that uh, that sums up that one. The other thing I wanted to know was um, was about uh, greenwashing. You know, we hear a lot about uh, green finance. Uh, we hear a lot about Hong Kong. You know, wants to become a centre for green finance. Um, there's a lot about a lot of governments talk about what they're doing. A lot of companies talk about what they're doing, uh, including companies that used to do nothing. Uh, and my question was really, uh, how much of this is greenwashing? How serious are companies, institutions, governments, and people about actually doing something um, for the planet? And and Paula's response was, things are being done uh, in a lot of different places and in a lot of different ways, but. Unfortunately, it's in a very fragmented manner and perhaps too fragmented to make the difference that needs to be made at the moment. So um, uh, what she says is that uh, people are not lying, uh, but they're, not, they're still not doing enough to, um, to, to do what, what needs to be done. And I think, I think that's true, not just of sort of governments that we might hate or co companies that we might disapprove of, um, but also for us as individuals. You know, uh, the other day, um, pret a started uh, offering a deal where, uh, in Hong Kong where you can get your coffee for $5 off if you bring your own mug. Now, I started doing it for a couple of days, but then I ran out of mugs because, of course, I never had the mug in the right place. But, you know, I th there should be a way we can actually sort of make ourselves more committed. So I'm now paying $5 a day too much for my coffee because I... I come in from the home. But I think we, you know, I and others and we should all change our behavior if we possibly can to try and make a difference. Because, of course, the problem is the disposable cup and the, um, the disposable plastic lid as well. Um, so let's see if we can uh, get another one here. Uh, yeah, that was the one. So, uh, Mr. Yi, perhaps you could ask your question and, and, and tell us where you're coming from. Have you still got the microphone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Paula, I got two questions for you. And the first one is about uh, what do you think about the uh, EU carbon market? <coughs> Could we say it is not successful? Uh, and the second question is uh, between carbon trading and carbon tax, which is your preference? Okay, thanks. And so you're from, are you from Hong Kong Electric? Yeah, yeah sorry, right? yeah, yeah. I forgot to talk. Uh, and, and can yeah, I ask, yeah. before, before I sort of give you yeah, the answer, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's written down here. Do, yeah, um, Hong Kong Electric. What, what do you think? I mean, what do you think about those two questions? Do you, do you have a sort of idea? Uh, of well, uh, for the my, my, my personal uh, impression is uh, for the EU market, it's, uh, so far it has not been effective to suppress the uh, well, carbon emissions, especially for some countries like, like Poland or even Germany. They, they actually uh, generate more from coal rather than uh, the other way around. And, and is the problem the price that was set in the... In the mechanism? In the I, 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 I have heard, uh, well, different comments. Uh, if, if it's from the business sector or the manufacturing sector, they complain the higher energy price may, well, uh, substantially cut down their uh, competitiveness, say, comparing with uh, the, the United States or whatever. But uh, unfortunately, I don't have the exact figure. So, sure, sure. Uh, because for most commodities, uh, other than the price, uh, I guess the uh, how how could they sell or what is the attractiveness to consumers? Um, price is only just one thing. Yeah. Thanks very much. And and just on the second question, which was about uh, carbon prefer, trading and carbon tax. Um, which which do you prefer, or which does Hong Kong Electric prefer? Maybe. <laughs> 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 well, uh, if for Hong Kong, uh, I don't think we have um, too much room better for for both. If for carbon tax. I suppose uh, most of the general public would object because the, uh, I guess the, the uh, argument behind is uh, where would the money go after the government or any authority collect the money? Like uh, the uh, petrol or, or, well, the government already imposed quite a heavy levy. And a lot of the uh, drivers, especially uh, those uh, well rely on uh, driving to earn their living, already complain like taxi drivers or lorry drivers. They already complain. 
yeah. uh, on the extremely high side. Okay. And they don't see any reason why they have to bear another, another form of tax. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's extremely helpful. Great. So now um, to come to Paula's answers. Um, she agrees with you about the EU carbon market. Um, it, it has failed in a way, um, basically because it was poorly designed, which I think is to do with the price, isn't it? That was, that was one of the key issues. The pr price of carbon was essentially too low. And over allocation uh, of um, carbon permits. That's right, yeah. Um, and, uh, but, but it is being redesigned, so the hope is that that will, that will change and that will improve. Um, and it has to work. Uh, and uh, there is the, the possibility, I think, of, of some kind of connection with China, linking up to China's. I mean, I guess a global carbon market would obviously be more efficient in the same way that we have a, a global oil market. Um, it, it is a problem as well, having isolated markets, you know, when, when it's a global issue, a global product in a sense. Yeah. Uh, on the, uh, the matter of carbon trading and carbon tax, um, Paula's response is that um, she prefers carbon trading again, with, with the right allocations and the right price settings, because you can never set a, hack, a tax high enough politically, which is what, exactly what you were saying, it's, a, it's an issue. Um, and, and then even if you do set it, uh, you can never raise it because, you know, politically people will complain. Although um, our finance ministers always seem to be able to rise the, raise the tax on beer and petrol in the UK, but um, that's maybe another issue. Uh, as sin taxes, yes. So. Um, great, so let's move on to the next one. Um, And, and feel free to ask any other questions. I mean, this is just the ones that I've got written down, um, uh, although the answers might be a bit slower. Um, sorry, who asked this one? Very tidy writing. Anyone have very nice writing? <laughs> Went to a French school, maybe? Um, it says, you mentioned you were able to see how important decisions got made. Oh, OK. Can, can we give the microphone over here, please? Um, the microphone over here? Yeah. Just say briefly who you are and, 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 and ask your question. Yeah. yeah. Hi, my name is Stephanie. Um, I work for a company where we look at uh, sustainability and we try to promote that uh, within China and also to Hong Kong. Um, so I, I, think my I think my first question was, um, or I guess Joyce or Paula. Uh, how decisions got made, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you, you talked about how you saw how decisions were made at high levels very quickly. So I was wondering if you could share kind of what those key points are so that we kind of know what we should be focusing on when we're talking to those decision makers. And the second part is um, related to, you know, she's, you've met with China, you, you dealt with the US and Castro. Is there, a, is there kind of a government type or organizational type that you find that, that's more accepting of these kind of climate change initiatives um, than, than the other? So China versus, you know, US versus Cuba. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I think the answer here, I'll, I'll read out in a second, but I think it's kind of, we have this kind of constant dilemma of the way democracies uh, are slow to take decisions. It's difficult because you have lots of, um, lots of different uh, stakeholders, whereas in a, in a dictatorship or in a uh, authoritarian system, it's much easier for the government to act when it decides to act. And we may be seeing that, I hope, with, uh, with China and climate change. Uh, you know, there are benefits to having centralized authoritarian systems, although they're not uh, always benefits. Um, so yeah, her, her response, Paula's response is, is pretty much along those lines I'm just seeing now. Cuba was in the vanguard even then, and Ch China is now way ahead um, because it's, it's leaders who, who know their stuff um, and, it's, uh, and it's the people under them who might slow things down. So I, I think that does relate to, um, to that issue. Um, when it comes to companies, um, the uh, companies can benefit, uh, as opposed to governments, companies can benefit by introducing, you know, climate-friendly policies if they, particularly if they're early ad um, adapters, uh, adopters of, of these policies, if they're early takers and early, um, you know, and I think we probably see that in the companies that have a good public image tend to be those that have taken a stand on these things early on. So whatever Ac Exxon says today, uh, we know that they went around the world because, I mean, I was approached years ago by people from Exxon telling people that climate change wasn't an issue, you know, in the, in the same way that... So we now see them rather like a tobacco company selling cigarettes, you know, that they're... Uh, even if they're doing the right thing today, it's going to take a lot for their reputation to turn around, whereas if you become an early adopter of a policy that turns out to be the sensible one, the right one that everybody is um, 
is espousing, then obviously it's a lot better. And, and um, another competitive advantage that Paula talks about in her answer here is, uh, uh, since you know, related to being an early adopter, but just being ready for the kind of changes that you meet, need to make, that obviously gives you uh, a competitive advantage. If you, are, if you and your company are prepared to do things, uh, then you're not going to be badly surprised. You know? And I, I think that would apply to things other than environmental policies as well. Uh, you know, so, for example, now we've got a whole issue of equality between men and women in companies. You know? and, and my company is, is not perfect, you know, Financial Times, but we kind of were fairly early adopters in the UK of trying to ensure uh, more equality in pay between men and women and in promotion between men and women. So, and that probably gives us an advantage. You know? So the same would apply, I think, to climate, climate issues. Yeah. Can you remember what it was? It was um, the uh, two questions, actually. Oh, okay. The first question is that the U.S. has backed out of the <coughs> Paris Treaty. Yeah. So um, I'm just wondering what Paul has thought on that. And the second question is like that China has now taken up the role in um, combat, to combat climate change. For instance, the largest floating, um, I think they call it the largest floating solar panel station yeah. in Anhui. Yeah. Is, um, has, I think it's, it's already started. So yeah. I was just wondering what's her thought on it. Is China policy going to stay or is it just a short-term measure? Thanks. Um, uh, on the issue of um, the US pulling out, I, I think I'm right in saying that it hasn't actually pulled out yet. Is that right? Or has it? It has. It hasn't pulled out yet, process-wise, and interestingly... Sorry, yeah, I got confused no, 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 so many tweets. No, 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 well, yeah, somebody called Trump tweets a lot, and I'm sure he's tweeted that. And he, uh, but he, interestingly, yesterday, in, well, you know, almost today in, in Asia Time, but yesterday in, in uh, Washington, he was meeting Macron, and one of the things Macron was trying to do was to persuade him to stay in the, the climate accord. So, officially, the U.S. hasn't actually left. It's just he's announced, you know, his intention to throw it in the bin. Uh, as he has with the Iran uh, deal on, on denuclearizing, or at least uh, limiting uh, Iran's uh, weapons programs. Uh, so, um, yeah, is there, is there a, this is a response about... Uh, yeah, so the, the, the bigger issue, uh, well, the, the, the more substantive issue, yeah, about China, um, you know, taking a leading role. Um, uh, Paula's response is that China's efforts are real, I think, but it is such a big country that it will uh, that it will take time to change what needs to change. And and the fact is that you know, as you probably know, Chinese coal production continues to rise, even though it is also the biggest current adopter of of solar power, alternative energy. So you know, they're doing both things at once. Uh, a bit like a bit like India, actually. India's sort of late comer to solar power, but is very big. But it also has a lot of coal-fired power stations that are still, uh, in some cases, under under construction. Um, and um, interestingly, Paula also makes the point about um, what China does outside the country may be inconsistent with what it does at home. And, and I guess that could be good and could be bad. Which, which one did you mean? Yeah. Uh, so, so financing, yes, I think, um, in other words, for example, uh, the Chinese are financing lots of uh, rather expensive coal-fired power stations in Pakistan as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and that is one way of giving work to Chinese contractors who are suffering at home because of, you know, attempts to limit coal, coal output. And recently, in fact, in, in China, we've had, um, you've probably seen stories in the papers about how, you know, the smog in Beijing was uh, curtailed for uh, a couple of months in the winter, basically because they severely limited um, coal production and steel production in the areas around Beijing. But what's happened really is that it's been displaced uh, to other parts of the country. It hasn't actually been abolished. Um, so, so there is a kind of problem of whether this is an image thing or whether it's an actual change in policy. Um, how else? How are we doing? Uh, yeah, uh, Florence has a question. Uh, Florence de Changy from Le Monde. Yeah. yeah. And our president of the club. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, thank you very much, uh, because I, I thought this was really uh, fascinating, and it's a shame we don't have your voice, but uh, it is a, a privilege to have someone, uh, someone like you uh, in the club. 
My question was um, about Cousteau, because you've worked with him a lot, and he is quite a controversial uh, figure, and I don't know if some of you have seen uh, one of the recent movies about him, where he is portrayed as quite a cynical, a very money orientated. He lost, he, it looks like he lost the plot of conservation and love of the ocean, whereas his son apparently was taking over and that's why there was a lot of friction. So you seem to have a lot of respect for him and as many of us do for what, uh, uh, for what he, he brought to us. But I was wondering, because since you had the, the privilege of working with him so closely, what is your perception of what was really going on inside um, his mind uh, in this, um, yeah, with, uh, in connection with, um, with the environment? I don't know if some of you have, have seen the movie I'm referring to, no, but, but was, it's a little what, what, bit disappointing. What, I mean, this, not disappointing in terms of, um, of uh, I mean, in terms of who the guy is, because he is such a hero, and I, I, I keep talking, by the way, so that uh, Paula has time to write, right? Uh, no, but, you're just garrulous. Can, you can't help it. Yeah. I, can, I can add something, because um, I, I had the privilege of knowing uh, Sir Peter Blake very well, um, and uh, uh, Sir Peter was uh, supposed to take over from Cousteau, actually, the... He, he was in, in the midst of doing that uh, with, uh, with the boat and he also, I had some feedback from Sir Peter Blake um, that the Cousteau Foundation and all that was, I mean, being destroyed by family issues, by the new wife. So, yeah, I'm sure you, you know a lot of the inside story there and I, I'm a little bit uh, curious. But your answer is long, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Uh, was there some issue about manipulating things to get good footage as well, um, which was probably quite normal in those days or not. I, I don't think oh. that one. Okay. Uh, I've, I've read something like that about a BBC, very important documentary recently, actually, when they made some people build their hut very high in the trees. I don't know if you've seen that, ah. which is a bit disappointing. Ah. I don't know whether Cousteau... Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, anyway, we, we have so the answer. Thank you. La réponse uh, is... <laughs> um, so he was not perfect. Uh, this is Paula speaking. Uh, Cousteau was real, he was charming, and he was brilliant. Uh, in the early days, he and the crew may have done some bad things. Oh, yes, this is what I was thinking, like feeding sharks to get filmed, but I'm, I really don't think that would be in any way unique. Um, but, yes, uh, so he may have done things, you know, to artificially get, get footage. Um, but he was, um, says Paula, about as real as it gets. Uh, and that movie was entirely nonsense, according to Paula. Uh, although the Cousteau Foundation was indeed... Um, destroyed by family arguments and by issues with the, the new wife. And I suppose that's Jacques Cousteau's new wife, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So partly right, but not in the substance of the film, according to Paula. So in a way, the guy is still a great guy. Yes. In your opinion, yes. OK, well, thank you. That's good news. <laughs> um, yes. yes, Paula wants to mention about an article. Antarctica. Antarctica, sorry, not an article. Antarctica, I've been there. <laughs> In 1991, he got the idea of doing a moratorium against oil exploration. Absolutely, yeah. He got the idea of doing this moratorium against oil exploration and exploitation and... In 1991. In 1991? And we did it. And you did it, okay. It's been 50 years from then to now. 50 years from then, 91, until now, no exploration no ex, well, yes, of oil. But there yeah. was the 1961 Antarctica Treaty anyway, this was, right? This was the Madrid Protocol. And then the Madrid Protocol came in, in 91. then yeah. in 91, and thanks to that, there is no exploration of Antarctica underground uh, and the sea, etc. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you're yeah. attributing this to him, right? Him working with Mitterrand and Bush, and I was the intermediary. So him? Mitterrand. Mitterrand and François Mitterrand, the French president, yeah. Oh, yeah, I yeah, never heard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and Bush father? Oh, in Australia. President yes, and, and Bob Hawke in, uh, in Australia, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Actually, if you, if so you look this, at... So yeah, these people you, together yeah. uh, agreed on the Madrid uh, Protocol, yeah. And, and what it says in our flyer is that Paula um, secured U.S. support for that moratorium, right, on, wow. on uh, oil and gas, um, oil and minerals exploration in Antarctica that, that became... That international law, yeah. So from a writer's point of view. From a, 
Oh, yes, from a writer's point of view. Okay, Bob Oak wanted a permanent ban. But that wouldn't fly in the United States. But that, that was not possible with the United States, so they only agreed on... So I changed the wording. Oh, you changed the wording, so that was the writer's input into this historical agreement to an ongoing prohibition, but with a 50 years um, thing. Well, yes. Okay, thank you not, very much. We're not lying about all its ways. See, say something, see if they can hear. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you so much, and, uh, and uh, you know, apologies for that uh, snafu, but I think you'll agree it was still a wonderful presentation, and it's great to have Paula here, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to speak to her at some point when her voice um, returns. Yeah. Thanks, thanks all for coming, and enjoy your coffee, and uh, there's no rush, and also enjoy the club. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I have to present a FCC gift. You'll never guess what it is. Uh, and uh, appropriate, I think, at the beginning of the monsoon season. So thank you so much, Paula, from the FCC. And the color yellow, I think, has no political significance, does it? It's a, uh, even though it is a yellow umbrella. Yeah.